Welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Emily Hoppus. I'm a senior technical officer at FHI 360. Um, and I'm so happy to welcome you to our event today. Um, as a part of my job, I manage something called the Contraceptive Technology Innovation Exchange, um, which is a platform intended to grow the global contraceptive research and development ecosystem through collaboration and knowledge sharing. And we are hosting this event today. Um, and the platform is really all about uh, collaboration and making connections between researchers who might not always talk to one another or collaborate together, um, which is why we're very excited about our event today, um, connecting social norms researchers with contraceptive researchers and developers. Um, so our event today is a part of a series on the CTI exchange called Beginning with the End in Mind, which is a way of looking at contraceptive R&D and trying to really think about acceptability, accessibility, affordability, and equity earlier in the R&D process. Um, so we have been making videos, putting out blog posts all throughout the year um, as a part of this series. And this is our first webinar. Um, and so we are really excited, excited to start this conversation today about integrating social norms research into contraceptive R&D. We have a wonderful group of panelists today joining us. Um, and I'd like to first introduce our moderator today. So our moderator today is Betsy Kostin Bader. She's a social scientist in the Global Health Population and Nutrition Division at FHI 360. She holds a master's in science from Harvard School of Public Health and a PhD from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's collaborated on and led research and intervention projects among populations at risk for sexual and reproductive health outcomes for more than a decade. Her research has a primary focus on understanding the social context of risk particularly the role of social norms and networks. And throughout all of her projects, she has maintained an interest in improvements in data collection and measurement te techniques. Combining these interests, she's recently served as the leader of the measurement subgroup for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, Global Learning Collaboratives to advance normative change, which was a network of over 400 funders, researchers, and program implementers working to advance the conceptualization and measurement of social norms. In this role, Dr. Kostenbader played a leading role in the development of numerous trainings, publications, reports, and tools on social norms, conceptualization, and measurement. So uh, I would like to please invite Betsy Kostenbader to uh, start our panel today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time zone you're in. This this should be a very interesting and useful discussion on integrating social norms research into contraceptive R&D with a panel of social norms and contraceptive R&D experts. So the idea for this webinar is that social norms research is not something many contraceptive researchers and developers are familiar with, but it's something that could meaningfully inform the work that they do, especially when it comes, as Emily mentioned, to ensuring the products being developed will be acceptable and accessible to the populations. So for this morning's discussion, it is my great pleasure to introduce an impressive trio of experts that we have with us, um, Ben Chislagi, Gustavo Doncel, and Dagmawit Tawahedu. Next slide. So uh, Ben Chislagi, Dr. Chislagi is an assistant professor in, the so in social norms at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the Center for Gender Health and Violence. Prior to LSHTM, he worked for various NGOs, um, international organizations, including UNICEF, the World Health Organization, International Labor Organization, and as a field researcher in West Africa with Stanford and Columbia Universities. Um, during the period of 2013 to 2016, he worked as the Director of Research Monitoring and Evaluation of the NGO TOSTAN, a leading NGO in the field of social norm change. And Dr. Chislagi's research has focused on how community-led development practices can help people renegotiate social norms and collaborate, increase health and gender equality. Dr. Chislagi uh, currently collaborates with various NGOs, such as Oxfam, Save the Children, World Education, and participates in various uh, international initiatives, the Learning Initiative on Norms Explo Exploitation and Abuse Project, 
um, um, uh, active on the Social Norms Learning Collaborative to Advance Normative Change, in which I had the pleasure of working with Ben. And at the LSHDM, he has gathered a community of experts on social norms and gender related harmful practices to advance existing understanding of how norms change and how they can be measured. Next slide. Gustavo Doncel is the scientific and executive director of Conrad, a US-based biomedical R&D organization focused on developing innovative user-centered affordable technologies aimed at improving global health, in particular in the areas of contraception and family planning, HIV, SDI prevention, and reproductive health. Dr. Doncel is also a tenured professor of OBGYN and microbiology and molecular cell biology, and he directs Conrad Research Libraries at the Eastern Virginia Medical School. After receiving his MD and his PhD, Dr. Um, Doncel completed a postdoctoral training on reproductive immunology at EVMS. Dr. Doncel has authored more than 170 scientific publications in the areas of contraception, HIV, STI prevention, fertility, sperm biology, pharmacokinetics, and reproductive immunology. He's a grant proposal reviewer and a scientific advisor for various research projects and organizations fo focused on biomedical prevention efforts and drug development. Among other awards, he recently received the Science Team Award from the Association for Clinical and Translational Science, and he currently is the principal investigator of ongoing research projects, totaling more than 80 million on women's health issues and product development related to contraception, HIV, uh, and reproductive and maternal health. Wonderful to have you with us this morning, Dr. Donzel. And finally, next slide. Joining us this morning from Addis Ethiopia is Dagma Wittawahedo. Um, she is a public health expert and assistant professor of health promotion and communication at Addis Continental Institute of Public Health in the Nutrition and Behavioral Sciences Department. Uh, Doug Mowit has been involved in different research projects as a technical lead and coordinator for over eight years in the Institute. She has a clinical and public health background, and she previously worked as a clinician in a rural public health hospital. She's been working as a qualitative re researcher and a technical lead for Bill and Melinda Gates funded intervention research project on adolescent sexual reproductive health and social norms, and has worked on many short term and long term research projects that involve social norms, sexual and reproductive health, behavioral studies, nutrition, non communicable diseases. She has extensive experience in designing field operation and analysis of a social norms research, especially around adolescent girls and young women's sexual and reproductive health, which is the focus of the uh, PhD, which she's currently pursuing in public health. Welcome, Dagma Witt. So before I turn it over the first question here, um, which I'm going to pose to Ben, I would encourage all of you throughout the session to use the Q&A function. Um, put, your, put your questions in there as the speakers are talking and then we reserve the last um, 15 minutes to entertain all of the different questions. So we look forward to um, an engaging discussion. So for the first question here, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Ben, and I'm going to pose to you the question. So as a social norms expert, you know, big question, what are social norms and social norms theory? Or how does an understanding of social norms differ from an understanding of user perspectives? Thank you. And after three years of lockdown, I still forget to unmute myself. <laughs> How long will I be doing this? By the way, I'm an associate professor, but I, I still forgot to change my bio. So completely my fault. Thank you for sticking <laughs> to what was written there, Betsy. All right. OK, what are social norms? Um, well, I guess most of most of what we know in international development, most interventions are usually framed around a very biomedical and cognitive understanding of how uh, action happens. Even the word, even the word behavior comes from comes from a behaviorism Skinner and and preludes alludes to the idea that we have a behavioral switch inside our body and it's all about turning it on and or on or off. And once it once it's turned on, we will never fall back into the into the old behavior, right? As if we were um, fixed machines. Of course, humans are not machines; they don't need to be fixed. And then, above all, nobody needs us to fix them. 
Um, and for those of you who have been smoking and trying to stop smoking, you know that the fact that you haven't smoked in a week doesn't mean that the behavior switch has changed and now you are a non-smoking uh, behavioral agent. That's not how it works. Yet much of, much of work in global health and international development has, has this idea that from um, that from let me see if I, from that just just by providing new knowledge here's why here's what is good here why family planning modern family planning methods are good this will generate people to take on those family planning methods we know that that's not true not only material resources uh, have an impact but most of all what people do and i i have 10 minutes so i will not go into examples but what people do have a huge what other people do what our friends do what our family do the people we trust, what they do has a huge influence on what we decide to do. One framework to understand what people do and how that influences us is the social norms framework. And, and I often present this as the most accurate diagram in, in the whole social norms theory um, that spans across different disciplines. So when we don't know the rules of the game, as they, uh, the rooster does uh, in this pack of flamingos, we try to to act accordingly to what we think the rules of the game are. Um, hence the rooster getting on stilts here to try and pretend to be a flamingo. And that's what we do all the time, right? When we, when we enter into a new place, <clears throat> into a new culture, into a new community, we activate our social radar and we try to position ourselves so that we're not weird, so that we're not the odd ones out. This is why, um, this, essentially, we abide to these unwritten rules, mostly unwritten rules. Sometimes social norms are written, but most unwritten rules about what actions are acceptable or appropriate. Try to, um, if you live in a place that celebrates Christmas and it's, it's a big family celebration, try not to come with gifts for Christmas Day or try to try and wait for your partner uh, to be their birthday and and not not even say happy birthday and see what happens right so we all have these ex these ex expectations of what we're supposed to do each other and if we don't that's when that's when we incur in negative sanctions and if we do we incur in positive sanctions we'll see a little bit more about sanctions in a minute so I mentioned there are many, many theories of social norms. What is a definition of social norms that comes from social psychology and is widely used in uh, global health? Well, the definition of social norms that comes from social psychology sees social norms as um, beliefs. So psychology, a belief about what's in the social. And the belief is this, what one person has, well, in this case, let's say what I have in my mind about what other people in my group do, what other people in my group, whatever my group might be, my family members, my colleagues, the appropriate group for every practice, they, the, the, the health providers, what they do and what they approve and, and disapprove, or to say it better, the extent to which they approve or disapprove of something. Um, so, so here's an example of, of this poor guy who didn't get the memo about getting, putting a blue hat on. <clears throat> the expectation here is that the cool kids have a blue hat on. This guy comes, breaks the expectation, and he incurs in negative sanction, being bullied or gossiped or maybe beaten up. So if there is an expectation that uh, young adolescent girls do not engage in premarital sex, then they might be ostracized or bullied for, they might think they will be ostracized of bullying for doing so. So they hold a norm that it is not appropriate for go young girls, unmarried girls to engage in premarital sex because they believe that they would be disapproved if they engage in premarital sex, they might still engage in premarital sex because that happens maybe in a place where nobody knows, but they might not go out and reach out to the uh, family planning provider, to the health provider, asking for a contraceptive because they don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be bullied. They don't want to be laughed at. 
So then an intervention is to engage these people in their interaction, not just working with young girls, telling them how important it is that they uh, use a form of contraception if they want to limit their number of their children, but they really need to engage at the interest at the inter in the space, the relational space between this one girl and her parents, between this one girl and the health providers, between this one girl and her peers, because this is the space where these norms are created. Importantly, a norm is not a personal attitude. Um, usually I tell this little story of this little girl who wanted to go dressed up like one of the um, KISS team members at a, at a um, wedding, but because her father anticipated the sanctions of the family thinking we will all be disapproved. And so the father and the mother force her to get dressed against her own will to comply with the norm of how a little girl is supposed to be dressed at a, a wedding. Now, this is important because a little, a little girl or a girl, an adolescent girl, for instance, or a woman for that matters, she might have a fa favorable attitude towards using family planning methods, more than family planning methods, but in accessing, anti she anticipates the scorn, uh, the, the sanctions, the negative sanctions that will come with her using more than family planning methods. And so she might do something that is against what she wants to do because she fears uh, the sanctions and she incites, instead, instead decides to comply with the norms of not using modern family planning methods. Large state of the evidence, we know that social norms affect child marriage, female genital cutting. The, the, the evidence on family planning is particularly wide. We have uh, uh, we are working with the Hewlett Foundation on a um, quite large uh, research, multi-layered research proposal on social norms and uh, family planning, particularly demand generation and unmet needs family planning. And we're about to come out with probably 10 papers on the issue. Women's economic empowerment, child vaccination, intimate partner violence, hand washing, maternal health. These are just some examples <clears throat> uh, of, of um, half of of the evidence that exists on harmful social norms. These are some examples of social norms just to make sure that the, this, the, the concept sinks in. Sinks in. This, this is a, 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 child, a kid who says, I wouldn't like to smoke, that's my personal attitude, but, the, the, but if I do it, I'll be approved. So I will, people will think I'm cool. So I comply with the norm even though that's not what I want to do. And I just give another example about drinking. I wouldn't like to drink that much. That is my personal attitude, but I want to do it to fit in, right? So really, again, one thing is what I want. One thing is what I believe people around me, the actions that I, that I think will make me gain social prestige or social honor or so good reputation. Now, three, four advanced key points. Sometimes norm exists in a specific reference group. So this is a kid uh, on the left, an adolescent girl thinking, oh, should I smoke or not? And she's really thinking about who should I impress? Maybe I want to impress these specific friends of mine. Other times the norms are out there in the market, in the ethical market, in the ethos of a society. Uh, you're not thinking about the, the, the woman in that picture who's... Uh, carrying out uh, those uh, shopping bags. She's not thinking about impressing particularly these people that she doesn't know, yet she confirms with the ethical or with the rules that are part of the ethos of her culture, because that's what you do. Sometimes norms have a direct relationship uh, with a practice or with an action, or again, with a behavior. The behavior or the action being, say, for instance, using uh, accessing modern family planning methods and the norm being people who access modern family plan planning methods are um, uh, promiscuous or morally um, uh, dis disputable. Sometimes there might be a constellation of norms. So here's the example of a man who hits his wife. He doesn't do it because men who hit the wi their wife are considered better, even though in some societies they might be, but there might be a system of norms that facilitates that behavior. The belief that you wash your dirty clothes in the family so you don't talk about it, uh, about the violence. The belief that a neighbor might hear but you respect the privacy of the family. The belief that a woman is supposed to tolerate violence. Then the third, second, last advanced point is that norms are in a system of factors. 
So, so norms are, are no silver bullet, magical bullet is extremely important that as you plan an intervention, you understand the place of social norms within the, the ecological niche of factors affecting the life and the choices and the actions of the people that you are serving with your intervention. And finally, there's a specific subset of, gen of norms and gender acts as a qualifier of those norms. Uh, and these norms include um, norms that are particularly affecting men's and, and women's behavior. And then my last slide wants to be just a small reflection on how norms exist also between us, uh, within USAID, within FHI 360, within Save the Children, within Oxfam. We all believe that uh, there are certain things that are just bluntly right, like generating demand for family planning, like using uh, target outcomes, like creating uh, proposals that have as success outcomes, uptake of family planning. And we are never self-reflective on those aspects. And these norms move across, um, move across policy make the intellectual elite and they create policy. And they eventually compromise the validity of the original source of those narratives. So there can be no meaningful family planning work unless there is self-reflective work that comes from what values are we holding and how we embody them in our practices and in our measures of success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. That was really um, no, great remarks. And thank you for calling us out on our, our norms as well. So hopefully we'll get back to some of those great points in our discussion. So I'm gonna turn now to Dr. Doncel and ask you to tell us, so as a contraceptives researcher, if you can tell us some examples of, your, of how social norms research has informed or would be useful to inform your work. Right. Thank you, Betsy. And okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. So yes, okay. Yes, <laughs> looks good. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I have no idea. Uh, now I uh, actually um, I'm looking at my screen too, and I can see you. Um, but anyway, well, I mean, I guess the first. Um, um, thing that I have to say is, uh, you know, people start with disclaimers and conflict of interest. I don't have any conflict of interest except for the fact that I am not a social scientist. <laughs> so uh, forgive uh, my um, perhaps improper use of certain terms and theories and confusion between social norms and gender norms. But, uh, but I bring the perspective of uh, for an R&D uh, scientists and and I think that if I understand correctly, the, the idea is not necessarily to discuss only uh, social norms and how they affect uh, contraceptive use, but rather see how is it that we can integrate social norms uh, research into the contraceptive R and D process. Um, so I, you know, I have to say that perhaps as a collective mea culpa, um, many of us in the contraceptive R&D field uh, believe that uh, if we have a good idea and that is biological, scientific plausibility, that's all we need. And then we go through a very standard process of R&D where we have the great idea and we do some initial discovery and preclinical testing, proof of concept, we get it into humans. We test it in a very controlled conditions, and um, and we prove that it is safe and effective. But we also have learned, and I think everybody knows, that safe and effective doesn't equate um, highly used, very effective, cost-effective intervention. And it is because if people don't use it, the method doesn't work. And I think in our classical pathway, we only incorporate, we start with this here, uh, and, um, and if the science is okay, we only incorporate uh, the social behavioral research where we'll look at preferences in social norms that allow them to use the product at the end. And at the end it's too late. Um, at the end you have spend a lot of money and time developing something that people 
don't use or don't use consistently. So you have low uptake or poor adherence. And uh, so we, we did something like this, unfortunately, and learned the hard way where we developed something that scientifically look uh, very promising. But when we got to a phase three clinical trial, only 20% of women use it consistently. And when we started to dig into uh, the issues, there was a slew of issues in different spheres from the personal attitudes to the social norms that pre prevented these women from using uh, the product. And at that point, we decided that we had to, our new products were going to, to start asking them, what is it that they like to use? Or what is it that they can use? What, what, what are the barriers, the social cultural barriers and facilitators of use of that product? Um, we, we, we send the group, a multidisciplinary group with uh, uh, people from our uh, team of uh, R&D and together with a uh, human centered design firm and together with some uh, fellows uh, that did um, social behavioral research in the countries and in, in the target countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this example is on, on um, South Africa. And when we started to pull out uh, a lot of elements that were individual and, and societal and preferences and norms that clearly affected um, what we were going to develop. And I think Ben actually uh, uh, highlighted this first point that we got uh, very clearly uh, where uh, there was opposition to adolescent girls to use contraceptives or HIV or STI prevention products. And that was in the family, that was in the community, that was in the healthcare providers. The healthcare nurses did not want, frown upon uh, young women um, coming and asking for, for methods to prevent, to control fertility or to prevent uh, HIV infection. Um, so that's a, that is there, it's a social norm and you have to understand and try to design as much as possible to help women use the products when they are available. Um, we also got from them, well, with men, the best approach is not to say anything. Um, with couples, in this case, there was a lot of unstable relationships living in different uh, houses. Secrets were the norm. Um, another element is, well, if it really looks medical, you're sick. People think that you're sick. And I don't like people to think that I'm sick and I'm healthy. I'm just you know, preventing, I, I want to avoid getting sick, but it doesn't matter. This thing looks, that you gave me looks medical and, and people immediately associate that with me being sick. Um, we also uh, found something that I think I've known for many years from maybe with my wife, uh, that a woman's handbag is generally off limits. And uh, it's actually by, by men intentionally ignored. So perhaps that was a, a place where we could um, use um, to, to get to the discreteness that we were starting to, to um, conceive as, as an element of our product development efforts. And then something that, uh, that, that sort of this was disconcerting to me and, and it is that there was a lot of, and, and clearly because I'm not a social scientist, I, I hadn't uh, faced this, uh, full front and it's the amount of belief, the magnitude of the beliefs in spells and myth. So, um, and as those are very difficult, but they're there. And, uh, and, um, and it, it, one should have also these in mind when, when designing products. Um, uh, we, we gather a series of key insights and, and decided to, to, to design a product um, that was um, geared towards m making women feel empowered, uh, giving agency, um, trying to demedicalize to the extent possible and, and try to be discreet and to enable discreteness of that product. And, um, and actually at, at that point, we were thinking about how to make it less noticeable. And apparently less noticeable sometimes is, uh, can be, can be disguised in plain sight. Um, 
so we we started to incorporate these things in the new uh, developments, uh, a multipurpose ring or an injectable or an implantable. Uh, but we, and, 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 and seriously, we change, for instance, the form and, um, and, and the composition of, of a vaginal insert. And, and after the process, this didn't look like this anymore. It looked like this. And, um, and we, when we saw that, we say, well, why stopping here? Um, why do we design these products from the standpoint of this, their stability and, and their um, ability to affect uh, the contraceptive or the HIV prevention uh, activity in a different way, having in mind that we need to make them appealing, we need to make them discreet, we need to make them so that women can use it. And we went all the way and, and designed not only the, the form uh, of the product, the release of the product, the stability of the product, but we also uh, redesign the, the packaging uh, we make sure that the pills did not rattle and, uh, and that nothing of this looked like a, a, a medical product, a contraceptive or an HIV prevention, and that, and that women could use them, um, could, could use the product to perhaps accommodate the product to their social environment and their lifestyle rather than the other way around, which is what we had been um, hoping for in the wrong way. All right, so I'm gonna stop uh, there. And, um, and again, I emphasize that in my opinion, R&D scientists had been doing this the wrong way, starting with flexibility and only at the end. But when you get at the end, you, you can only start working with social norms. The product is a product that is there and it has been approved and nobody uses it. And we don't understand why is it that the people don't use it, right? But like Ben said, uh, it's not enough to say this is 100% effective and totally safe. If there is a norm that, that, that goes against the use, then you're gonna have a very small percentage and the intervention is not cost effective. So really, Contraceptive R and D and global health R and D should start with end user in mind. Great, super useful insights and, and thoughts, Gustavo. That's really interesting. I hope we can get, come back to this um, in the Q and A. A reminder to everyone to please feel free to put your questions into the Q and A, and we will get to them in time. I'm going to turn. This is a great segue. Your points to the next panelist, which is um, we're going to turn it over now to Dogmawit. Um, and Dogmawit is someone who has conducted uh, social norms research on contraceptive use. And so um, Dogmawit, can you tell us a bit about your experience conducting research uh, related to con uh, norms around contraceptive use and a bit about your methods and some of the insights that you gleaned? Dogmawit, you're, um, Dogma, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, as Betsy mentioned, uh, uh, I will be drawing on some of our experiences uh, with social norms uh, research around contraceptives. I'm joining you all over from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and uh, I'll be drawing on some of our experience. So one of the research studies that I was involved in is the improving adolescent health reproductive through structural solutions. This was a five years uh, research project that aimed at improving adolescent health, sexual and reproductive health, contraception being at the heart of it. So it was a quasi-experimental study and it had a pilot, a baseline, a midterm, routine monitoring, and finally an inline evaluation and we employed both qualitative and quantitative methods. So um, for this project, for the qualitative component, we involved 
uh, individual and key informant interviews using semi-structured interview guides. And then we use, also used focus group discussions where we basically used, which we basically used to identify social norms. And we used um, locally designed vignettes for this. And we also used case reviews as well as um, case studies supplement our studies. Uh, our, in the quantitative uh, surveys, it was actually, those were the baseline and eight-line surveys, were large-scale surveys of more than 10,000 sample size. And we used structured uh, survey questionnaires for this survey, but for the social norm components of the assessment, we used um, systematically designed questions that help us to elicit social norms in a way that does not directly frame respondents to reflect their ideas. So the core participants were uh, girls, adolescent girls, between the ages of 13 and 17, and also their reference groups. The reference groups mean the people who um, are the main decision makers or the influencers of their choices. So the, for the married girls, the, those were the, has, their husbands and their mothers-in-law, whereas for the unmarried girls, it was the, their parents, the fathers, mothers, and also um, the boys, I mean, the, their brothers. So the girls themselves are included as sisters, but they are also our main participants. So uh, this was in one of the regions. In, the, in another region, we again, uh, had experience working with the towards economic and sexual reproductive health outcomes for adolescent girls. So this was another initiative with more or less similar uh, aim with the first one, but it was implemented in a totally different setting. So we started off with assessing the changes on social norms affecting the SRH of uh, ever married girls. This one is Quite different because we are mostly dealing with uh, girls who have marital history. So after assessing these changes, uh, we then went back to uh, do an ex post evaluation after about two years since the uh, study, I mean, since the project was completed to see if there were any effects or diffusion of um, the main outcomes of the project. So, and then this study then gave birth to the next study, which where we wanted to assess any pathways for um, uh, sustainability and also scalability of the project for, um, to, to be scaled to other regions also. So just to show you some of the examples of the tools that we used. The first example here is, uh, vignette tool. So the vignettes were the most useful tool for us to study, understand, and also uh, measure social norms to some extent. So uh, the way we uh, designed the vignettes is during the pilot assessment, the mini assessment, we had prolonged engagement in the area to understand the daily lives of these girls, how normally things happened. We even had to learn uh, common trendy local names and the wordings the girls use, things like that to develop stories that resonate with them um, specifically. So after portraying this story for them that you see here, we impose five questions for them. So the first two questions, we, uh, we ask them to identify uh, descriptive and inductive norms. After that, uh, after we elicit the injective norms, we give them a scenario what might happen if a girl decides to go against the norm, what consequences or sanctions would she be subject to, because that would help us to identify how strong the norms are or how the girls perceive the strengths of the norms are. So after that, we then ask them in the fourth question, uh, how sensitive these girls are, whether to stick to their decision or to refrain from breaking the norm. So that lets us assess the strengths of the girls, the sensitivity of the sanctions. And finally, exceptions, or we also call them the conditions, will be the instruments for intervention where we ask them a theoretical question. What would be uh, a more or less acceptable scenario for this girl to 
break the norm may still be okay, not be sanctioned that, that much, and that would be interesting uh, entry point for intervening. So, uh, to also show you some examples of our survey questions regarding social norms, so um, instead of directly asking, as we do the traditional way, the survey questions are like, how do you, um, do you use contraceptives or do girls like use contraceptives? What's your attitude? What's your practice? Things like that. We just give them a statement and then uh, try to get the response in a, uh, in a range that we put here in a Likert scale. So we ask, for example, in the descriptive norm questions, most married adolescent girls talk to their husbands about using contraceptives. And then we get their agreement from agreeing a lot to agreeing a lot. We capture the response as such. So for every descriptive norm question, we also follow up with an uh, inductive norm uh, question so that we can uh, understand if there is a social norm involved. So uh, finally, what did we learn from this research? The first one is we learned that contraceptive norms highly uh, differ geographically. For example, even for our uh, for the two regions that we work in, even if within the same country, they were totally different uh, societies that differ in socioeconomic backgrounds, in religion, in culture, in rituals, in, in everything. So, and the sanctions are also even if both societies. Uh, were unfavorable for this contraceptive use, the social norms and I mean, but the sanctions in the pathways were totally different. So uh, highly specific context and progressness is vital if we want SRH interventions to be uptaken by the societies. The other thing we learned is that uh, social norms around contraceptives were very conservative and very restrictive because it was also a rural areas. This was the rural areas and we were dealing with adolescent girls. So uh, people really did not like talking about them more than them being a strong social norm. People did not like talking about it. It was not culturally, religiously appropriate to the people. So, it was difficult getting people to speak about these things because they usually withdrew when we got to the contraceptive section of our questionnaires. So one of the things that really helped us was using the locally designed vignettes, which helps people to talk, to talk about it more, more freely because it does not put them on the spot. And it just... Um, uh, since it does not frame them directly, it makes conversation, uh, sensitive conversation less, um, less uncomfortable for the people. And also for us, the researchers, it was useful because we could elicit much more deeper and um, much more accurate information than we would have if we used the traditional methods of direct questioning. And the same goes for the surveys as well, asking them in a systematic way. So the other thing we learned was, in comparison to early marriage norms, we learned that contraceptive norms were less strong because whether it's for the unmarried girls, even though um, premarital sexual uh, engagement is frowned upon, people know that they secretly engage in sexual activities. And what we actually found out was that if she's engaging in sexual activity, better if she uses contraception than um, giving birth without, oh sorry, giving birth without, um, mer uh, without, uh, not within a weight lock. So uh, talking about it was uh, much more, uh, uh, much more uh, discouraged in the society than actually being a strong social norm. So as long as it happens, certainly had room for accepting. So, um, so this provides us uh, the insight for sensitivity to sanctions and also uh, the social conditions for interventions. And finally, uh, girls who are expected to conform to the social norms uh, 
highly lack the agency to shift, to challenge, or to change the social norms given their young age, low comprehension, comprehension level, and also being marginalized away from information. And also, most of them did not go uh, far in their education, so they highly lack the agency, which, which is why it's very important to identify and include the reference groups in the entire intervention. Thank you, Doug Moet. That was really interesting. I enjoyed hearing about your um, your research and the, the methods and insights. So I want to be able to preserve time uh, to take the, some. I see there's some questions that are queuing up in the Q and A screen for the for the panelists to take questions from the attendees. But I wanted to post one more question to each of the panelists. We're going to do a lightning round. Just one quick thought from each of the panelists. You know, so one of the purposes here is this idea of building better collaboration. So what suggestion, I'd love a suggestion each of you from each of you about building more and better collaborations between social norms researchers and contraceptive developers. And um, I'm going to start, maybe we'll go in reverse order and I'll start with Dagmawit. What is, what suggestion might you have for us? Uh, yeah, so um, contraceptive developers, um, need to collaborate with local researchers, in my opinion, to identify social norms related to issues, because that would be helpful to design appropriate interventions to promote the acceptance, the utilization of contraceptives. So the engagement could be perhaps in identifying issues or norms around contraceptives to start with, and then to also to identify the influencers and also the specific sanctions in the specific areas so that they can prepare for backlashes and things like that. And also to develop at least appropriate interventions that would work in the specific society. Over. Great, good, good suggestion. Gustavo. Um, well, I mean, it is very clear that contraceptive um, researchers or R&D product developers should incorporate social behavioral scientists in research early on in product development. And, um, and that, that should be a focus on local researchers because that's uh, also the way to get to the target population. That said, it, that's easier said uh, than done because you need funding in order to do that. So my, my concrete suggestion, I mean, the overarching recommendation is to increase collaboration. And I think we, the R&D side, should be more mindful of the impact of uh, ignoring social uh, research. Um, in, but the practical recommendation would be for funders to incorporate um, a requirement uh, it, when, when they put these RFAs that, um, that are for contraceptive R&D, there should be a component that, that sort of demands the incorporation of um, social research and how is it that social research will modify the product development process. Actually, I, I'm, I'm speaking by experience and we suggested this to a group. The group incorporated that and it did uh, pay off. It, 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 it fostered collaboration. Love that. Love that recommendation. <laughs> Great. And how about you, Ben? Um... I think the field of international development and global health is largely um, imperialistic and colonial. And if we really want to talk about collaboration, then we need to flip it. Uh, and then we need to get USAID to engage, to start going down and asking USAID, DFID, I mean, I'm saying USAID to say donors, the Gates Foundation, every donor to co-design grants with the population that they aim to reach, um, to break down silos until we think of family planning as detached from education, as detached from wash, as detached from nutrition, we're never going to achieve sustainable and um, effective change. Um, and until we are ready to get to the root causes of the social injustices that are resulting in a bunch of harmful outcomes, in, including the uneven distribution of resources, the lack of a maximum salary for billionaires, uh, the fact that um, we are extremely attached to outcomes and we do development by outcomes, until we change those things, then we're not reaching collaboration or, or that we are 
um, trying to do is to show that we are the ones responsible for manipulating people's lives and achieving certain targets so that we can make career and pay our mortgages. If we really are interested in collaboration, then we need to drop desire of attribution and, and engage in serious, slow-paced partnership with people living in the most vulnerable and resource-deprived areas of the planet and design grants with them based on their needs, not based on silo strategies. The, okay, so it's hard to follow that recommendation. That's great. Yeah. That was fantastic. The bar is really very good. hard. Very hard to follow that one. Very, very hard. That's because, that's because capitalism protects itself. It's a, it's a, it's a drama. It's, it's a drama of the commons. Nobody wants to do it because we would lose our jobs, right? So we'd rather keep grinding a system that is only serving mostly middle-aged white men, but also white women or generally people who live in the global north, rather than actually de-hinging it, de-hinging the door of international development to actually do work that matters, because that requires uh, changing deep-seated capitalist biases and norms that we're not ready to touch, I think. So I was going to make a suggestion that um, is is not is a bit more tepid than Ben's, but it relates to, ben, to the points that Ben and Gustavo um, and Dogma Witt made, which is that I wanted to plug the idea that that you know for contraceptive R and D researchers that that resources exist and there and, and uh, networks exist of people who are doing this work in different parts of the world. So this is a slide that. Um, focuses on resources across different program phases, thinking about people developing social norms interventions, but um, much of it applies. And, um, and some of these links here um, link to, pl to places where there are um, compendiums of different kinds of measures of social norms uh, related to contraceptive use um, to the Align network and I'm not sure if I have time uh, to, to take us there but there is um, you know where we you can connect with you, there's a map of the world if you go to the next slide Emily um, there's a map of the world showing where social norms focused interventions and research are happening you can click on a different country and find out who's doing work there and hopefully connect up with the folks in in, in that local um, play, uh, you know, uh, place setting that are doing the doing work that can inform your your research. So I did want to plug that, um, you know, there are connect, uh, resources and networks of folks who are doing this work that that would be interested and keen to collaborate. Um, but I will stop there in order to have time to take some questions. Um, so this first question I see here um, is a great question from Nishan um, that asks, you know, we see how couple dynamics can play an important role in product use, but in many research in the social, sexual reproductive health domain, the unit of research is either women and girls or men and boys rather than their relationship. Why is it so? What are the methodology limitations when it comes to putting relationships at the heart of the desired data? So um, I don't, if, I have a few thoughts on that, but I don't know if any of the other panelists would like to jump on that question. The only thing I could say is that in that example of the uh, um, uh, research that we did, we incorporated relationships and partnerships. Uh, and, and it is true that it, you, you get different answers um, when you uh, focus on that, on the, on the relationship rather than say on a group, on a PR group. Yes, absolutely you do. And as someone who has a background as a social network analyst, as well as a social norms researcher, I would say that um, there are a lot of methodology challenges, I would say, to doing this type of work, right? It's hard to, it takes more time to find out about the relationships. Um, it takes more time to analyze the data and it's hard sometimes to get permissions to connect with all the folks in the network. I would also say that um, we conducted a literature review of, um, social norms, uh, contraceptive use measures in 2016. And, you know, one of the things we see in the literature is there's often assumptions about relationships, um, when in fact, I think it, you know, again, this goes to, the, goes to the suggestion we had about the funding and taking the time to build these things. We need to actually go into these, 
these these social contexts and ask people about who are the relationships. We can't we make these assumptions coming from um, our colonial perspectives about what relationships are important. So I think that's something I would add there. Um, Holly has a question here. She says, do you recommend designing practice products to conform or work within existing social norms, or do you recommend attempting to modify the social norms to increase use of the product? Great question. Who would like to take that question? Well, I would like to start by saying that, of course, this is by deformation. I wouldn't know how to change a social norm. Uh, so I would go with the product, but it's also, it makes sense because social norms are ingrained and, and they're also have multifactorial. I think they, you can do something with the product to accommodate, to use certain social norms to your advantage as facilitators and some others that are barriers maybe to circumvent. Ben, go ahead, you have your hand up, go for it. Yeah, um, I, I think the question makes me suspicious because I, uh, it, it has an eco social engineering that I don't particularly like. Um, which is part of the, um, what some of my colleagues call, call the fascist nature of global health. Um, I, think, I think it's not anyone's role to modifying social norms. I would rather ask how, what are the processes to make sure that people who really want to in, uh, take on fam modern family planning methods and can't because of the norm, how do we help those people facilitate, create a movement, a civil, a civil movement of change that is people led so that they can start the negotiation and the conversations in that incoherent and, and, and diversified uh, space that is the ecological niche that they inhabit uh, so that then they can lead change in social norms. I think too much often, we believe that just by that, that, that global health is a, is a piece of chess. I instead try to, to, to I would invite us to, to flip the board of chess and say, how do we, how do we help people achieve lives that matter to them and reframe and rephrase and, and, and rename um, obstacles such as norms. And to do that, there are wonderful examples uh, across the world, and there are a few uh, reviews of these examples. But, but uh, yeah, again, this goes down to do it to change, to change the way, to change the norms within the international development and the global health system requires changing the system of incentives within it. Otherwise, the risk is that we only create external motivations and not internal motivations. Then people do things because we told them to, right? And and that doesn't really. I don't think that's sustainable. Yes, that's a great point. So many great points. And I'm so sorry that we've, we're kind of coming to the end here. And I think we need to close out. But um, so much food for thought. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I'm going to turn it back over to Emily here for a minute to close us out. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful discussion. I wish that we could talk for an hour more. I feel like there's so much more to say. Um, but I do want to encourage you to uh, keep following the CTI exchange. I'll put some links in the chat for you to do so. Um, and I do want to thank our donor, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for host allowing us to host this panel and for all of our panelists. Thank you so much for your thoughtful leadership in this space. Um, and thank you all for joining the webinar today. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank this you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.